This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. This podcast is sponsored by the sour beer drinking folks at Fooder Crafters. They make fooders specifically for breweries and love every brewer they have ever met. Fooder Crafters would like to say thank you to all the good people in this industry. Cheers. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Bogner, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. My guests today are Doug Reeser and Tim Gormley, the uh, co-founders, two of the three co-founders of Burial Brewing in Asheville, North Carolina. Welcome, Doug and Tim. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Excited to be here. Of course. Um, some of you who read Craft Beer and Bring Magazine might have noticed that uh, Burial uh, received one of our uh, spots on our, our Best 17 Beers of 2017 uh, for the past year. They have come out of, uh, over the last, what, six years, you've, you've grown from brewing on a tiny one-barrel nano, nano brew system to a, a 10-barrel brew pub system, and now... Uh, what a thirty barrel! It's a it's a four vessel twenty barrel system, and they're uh, sixty barrel batches for the most part. Sixty barrel batches mm-hmm. in the large scale production. Going to do what ten thousand barrels this year or so? Yeah, I think yeah, we'll I that. think we'll I think we'll confidently hit that ten thousand line with potentially a little bit more growth if our sour sour program puts out a little bit more. And all this from a brewery that uh, is branded with uh, a, a pretty. Um, how should I say it? Uh, uh, metal? You distinct? Want to say metal? Yeah, you're, yeah, metal, metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, but a, but a, a style and approach that is is really uncompromising and uh, distinct. Not necessarily a brand that tries to open itself up to everybody and uh, uh, and be everything to everyone. Uh, how do you how do you build a you know from that kind of scale? With that kind of attitude and uh, doing exactly what you want to do, I mean, there's lots of folks that would love to do that, and and many that aren't as successful as you are doing it. I mean, I I think it's very multifaceted. Obviously, a lot of it is about just quality of beer. Um, we've always made had just such a concentration on on quality, um, and obviously unique and diverse selections and. And then, of course, there's the the kind of just being ourselves element and doing what feels right, speaking from the heart, um, trying to st- tell the stories of the beer, trying to um, you know make a you know have a have a beautiful package or a, a, if not a, a package that asks causes you to ask questions and wonder what's going on there, and that's that's just a big. A big part of of our whole kind of mentality is just do do what what feels right, what feels cool to us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say. I mean, I think you touched on it perfectly, Tim. I mean, it's peaking curiosity. I mean, I, whether or not you you look at the burial brand and you think it's polarizing, um, you wouldn't be wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't lure in everybody out there. Um, whether it's whether you're the type of person that responds is like hell yeah look how metal that is <laughs> or you're the type of person that's like i my mind is really confused and i'm concerned about the depiction on this can i need to evaluate it and interpret it and i think that that's um i mean we 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 spend an immense amount of time and uh and overhead in trying to be very intentional about what our packages look like for that reason you know, at a time when a lot of folks out there on the, on the larger scale of craft beer brewers are, are trying to simplify and make their stuff more colorful and make things more readable and uh, make it easier to find their stuff on the shelves because, you know, shelves are so crowded these days. You guys have really gone in the opposite direction from that and made it uh, a little harder to decipher. I know I said the other day, it seems almost like the old days of, of flipping through record bins and coming across a vinyl album cover where there's not a name of an artist on the front of it and you're trying to figure out what the hell this thing is uh but you pick it up and you start to look at it and get intrigued by it just because uh, it's not necessarily so accessible at first glance yeah i mean we we very intentionally try to breed that like interpretation um desire like we every every single can is 
we've never ever made a decision about something in a we need to go this direction with the color or we need the package to pop in this way shape or form it's no i want that animal eating that animal's <laughs> entrails <laughs> um it is i mean and, and you're right i mean all of our cans are silver i mean they they look the same unless you take a, a closer look but i think they beg you to take that closer look and i think that that is um and it's not only just looking at the art. I mean, you kind of have to search to figure out who the brewer is and then what the style is. And you got to turn that can around to read the story. And, you know, every every can or bottle has a has a, a very distinct story that are in, in many times and very often very emotionally connected to the crap we're going through as people um, or these breweries going through. And I think that that's one of the things that I'm very proud of is is how transparent that we how transparent we try to be. Um, through that creative process. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's some element of us from from a personal standpoint where we, even outside of the beer world, where maybe you could call it like a subcultural type of concept, whether it's like a piece of physical art or a piece of music or whatever, where it's like if it flies a little bit under the radar, you feel like you've discovered something new and exciting and you get really you know, into it and like, oh, this, you know, this album sounds a little bit different than anything else I've heard before. Like, I can't wait to tell my friends about it. And I think that in a way ties back into the kind of rare beer idea where there's people that are like, oh, I have this beer, but not that very many other people have access to it. So I can't wait to share it with everybody. And I think that the, to a, to a degree, craft beer is kind of a subculture and I think we are a subculture within the subculture, if you will. And I think that there's some element of the way we um, we put ourselves out there, um, even though it's not really intentionally that. It's just us being us. But it ha- it comes across as being that kind of like, I want to know more about this. Sure, sure. You mentioned quality a minute ago, and I think this is you know that's something that's been on my mind. There are a few few breweries and some of your peers out there in the market that over the last two years, I mean, you know, I've, we've been publishing the magazine for about four now. Uh, we've watched an evolution occur where, you know, the first time I had your beer, it was fine. It was, it was good beer, but it wasn't remarkable beer. And it wasn't beer that just set me back and said, Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh. And and then we're done here. We're walking. Out. <laughs> How dare you? We're gonna get really, really real, right <laughs> you know. But but uh, you know, and and you're not the only ones. There, I mean, there there are plenty of, of breweries out there like that. But and then something seemed to happen, and then and there was this evolution that occurred, and it started maybe two two and a half years ago uh, from what the beer that I tasted may have been a different time frame, you know, from the time that it took to filter. But something, you know, there was this kind of just big move forward and there was a moment where he tasted the beer again like wow wow something happened here and this beer is uh um you just hit your stride uh but what you know as you look back on that personal evolution and that brewing evolution for you all um you know it has to have been a struggle starting on a one barrel system and then making these changes and figuring these things out as you go with fairly limited resources having you know bootstrapped the whole brewery yourselves like (laughs) i mean that's you know what? What is it? And tell me about that evolutionary process and how you how you got better at, at making beer uh, over the last six years. There's so many things that flashed through my brain as yeah, you the set you said that. I mean, I think to try to get back to the beginning, you know, Doug and I home brewed for a while and and tried to dial in some recipes as home brewers and you know right kind of simultaneously when we were getting serious about home brews, I was. A professional brewer as well and when you have both of those sides of the coin you you start to realize that it's in a lot of ways easier to make better beer uh, when you have all of the tools at your fingertips that you have at, at a pro- professional brewery whether that's you know just the equipment in itself or the um, you know the types of chemicals that you use or you know the access to proper carbonating procedures and you know all there's so many facets that as soon as you become really as the larger you get uh seemingly the more access you have to better 
materials and and resources and people. Uh, pe- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that's kind of just to get way back to the sure, beginning, because sure. in a way, when we first started, we we were kind of glorified home brewers. You know what I mean? A one barrel system. We didn't have glycol. Um, you know, there was so many things that we were just kind of like we were limited by right. um, in our, as far as our quality goes. And then, you know, I mean, I don't know. Doug, you, we, we could probably go back and oh, forth man. about I mean, all the so many. <laughs> I, yeah, I won't, I won't dive in so much, but I mean, anybody that knows me and, and Tim or that we're like constant evaluators, we both have insanely high standards um, for our beer. Um, we know that every single, every single can that rests in somebody's hand or glass is like the one chance you may have with that consumer to make a difference. Um, very intentional with the beers that get out to specific places because of that. But, um, you know, if, if Tim and I don't like a beer, <clears throat> we're working on it, you know, maybe that batch, maybe we're continuing to work with that batch. Maybe you were, um, we're not sending it. Maybe we're not packaging that batch. Um, but you guys I, do that? You taste every batch before it gets sent out? Or? I, I, I do here. Tim does there. I mean, and, and if I could at both places, I would. I mean, sometimes it's hard, but sure. like we both mutually respect each other's opinions very strongly. We have, we have different palates, but I think of, of, we have the same quality standard. Um, quality is never, the quality is like never compromised here. You know, whether or not you love the way that hop sings or not is not necessarily indicative of a poor quality. I mean, if, if we had a, qual- a defect, like an inherent defect or infection, pheno- phenolic thing, anything like that, that beer's, that beer's gone. And those happen very few and far between. We, we've been very fortunate to make very good, high-quality beer at an incredibly high percentage. I mean, we, I, can't, I could count the amount of times we've dumped a batch on a, on a hand um, over here. Um, well, I think we- another big element to that as we've grown is to try to – instill that that way of thinking into our staff because yeah. more and more you know we our hands aren't fully involved in in all the steps to making beer and you know it's taken us literally like years of sitting down with our staff and tasting beers and being like what do you think about this and then we already know what we think about it and then to get them almost to our same level of quality where they can go to us if there's some period along the life cycle of that beer where they're like, you know, this, they're not afraid to say this isn't right, even if they made it themselves and maybe feel very connected to it and think we might look down upon them for messing it up. We're, you know, it's been hard to be like, no, we're, we're not going to look down on you. You, you know. There's a margin for error. Like there's right, an acceptable right. margin of error across the board and. Tim's right that instilling that in the staff is, is so incredibly important. We are super fortunate to have people who aren't going to get defensive every time and they they care. Like they understand the market impact of those right. beers. It's really hard to teach a staff, you know, owner mentality, that's easy. But teaching that to your staff and entrusting them to make decisions about a batch of beer that might be $50,000 a, a beer down the drain. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard to get that, and we are really fortunate. The team that we have here today, we entrust them. And, I mean, I've, I've seen them rally up together after a beer even that I tasted and, and put together notes and then call me into a room and say, hey, I don't think this is up to your standards. And uh, they've been right before, even when I've missed it. So uh, mm. we're, we're really fortunate to have a, a group of people here that understand how important every single batch of beer is and, and that, we have the financial wherewithal to actually <laughs> make those decisions because sure, we sure, didn't sure. in the past right i mean we right. were trying to keep taps filled i mean i remember when we just had the one facility and we had this booming yeah. tap room we're trying to keep taps filled i mean that was that's right. hard i mean right. to ever have to make that decision on oh man i need this batch of beer so bad am i willing to sacrifice quality like that's not even a discussion anymore right. ever and it really hasn't been for the past you know, year and a half or so. So that's, I mean, I guess that is an interesting thing to think about that, uh, the scale, I mean, a lot of, you know, craft beer and severe craft beer enthusiasts are attracted to smaller and smaller breweries, but there is something to be said for, for some of that scale, giving you the resources to more fully realize a vision that you have for the beer that you make, whether that's, Mm -hmm. 
you know, some of the luxury of, of getting rid of beer that you don't want to sell or, or the way to you know, make sure that that stuff doesn't go wrong. Um, you know, how do you, how do you balance that though, as your business grows and as you hit larger and larger production volumes, I mean, it has to be, there still has to be some challenge to, to being as cool as the hot new kids on the block. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you make a good point. I think we've made some conscious decisions about our distribution to kind of, you know, spread what we do make out a little bit thinner across the marketplace. So, you know, it's not as easy to access, but I mean, ultimately I think for us, it's been a big product of having two facilities now where we have the capability to, to make some of our more tried and true successful beers here and, um, and allow that, be to be the means for us to experiment and get get crazy and um, and do some really off the wall exciting things at at our pub brewery. Um, so the, yeah, and also that a big part of that is just having true separation of clean and and funky, which mm. you know a lot of people don't have that luxury, and it does again like uh, everything we're talking about, every little step that we've done as we've grown has had you know in the back of our mind it's been a conscious decision to make the quality better you know it's like we want to we desperately want to make mixed culture saisons but we we only have one facility like is that smart so we we basically had to decide to not make those beers until we had had the proper means to do them and do them well Um, and now we're finally to that place which is really special but even that's still growing and evolving and we're in the process of building a, a a funky sour you know facility of its own to house these beers so that the temperature control is right and you know every, every all those little details that in a perfect world we would have had the money to to create that atmosphere initially and that just wasn't realistic so we had to be patient and slowly chip at it and you know even i'd like to think that five years from now our quality will be even on another level of it is right now as we sure get the infrastructure yeah i mean once you once you already invested in quantity your next investment in quality you know quality of life for you the people that work there and the quality of your beer i mean you can only buy so many tanks i mean i believe that i know that there's breweries that are like i'll find another building damn it we're not. Well, here's our buildings. They only fit so many tanks, and they're about to be full. You know, I mean, where do you you don't just start? You know, it's not like you stop reinvesting in your in your business. It's not like Tim and I are going to buy a, a jet plane. <laughs> we don't, not that we could ever do that. Anyways, but uh, you know, you you continually invest in in better quality. You know, and that's 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 easier um, once you've once you have the the facilities the way that we have them now where we have the opportunity to make any type of beer anytime we want at either facility and so we can invest in uh in more quality based equipment and i think i'd like to add really quick before we change the subject that because i feel like we do a lot of collaborations here and i feel like that's become a little bit of like a topic of discussion when they when Hmm. people think of burial okay i think of that and i think that I'd be remiss to not mention that as being such a huge source of our ability to increase our our quality because of just the access to um, all those all these different minds of brewing. You know, that's really a conscious decision. Again, when we approach these collaborations, it's like what what do we have to learn from them? And and really, it doesn't matter how big they are how long they've been around um everybody it seems like everybody has a slightly different approach to things different even if it's the most seemingly insignificant process you know you you it can uh, it could save you 30 minutes in a day you know and that could be huge everybody has run there are a thousand different roadblocks out there and everybody's run into a different one and they've had to find a way around it and that's the best thing you learn from collaborating. And I think, you know, it's always a mutually beneficial relationship. And, you know, we share those small victories that we've had and they share those ones with us and we all learn from it. You mentioned kind of stopping 
where you are now or, or around the, the same barrels you are not building new tanks and, and adding on to the breweries to sticking it around that 10,000 barrel mark. You know, now Doug, you came out of a, a business where a legal background and have represented breweries. And uh, certainly there had to be some idea that, you know, growth seems to be the mantra that most breweries just live by that if you can grow, you need to continue to grow. Um, that mentality over the last year or two, maybe on the rocks a little bit as as that attempt to growth you know to continue to grow and uh, the leverage that some of those breweries have taken out and some of the debt and the overhang and uh that hasn't been met by some of the expected growth is is starting to put some breweries out of business um you know and that changes that mindset a bit but nonetheless it still has to be a fairly bold philosophical move from a business perspective in a capitalist economy to say hey we're going to get to a size that we want to be, and then we're just going to stay there. Uh, I mean, you're kind of flying in the face of all capitalist logic at that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I like the way you say it, though. It makes <laughs> us sound more badass. But uh, we, uh, man, Tim and I and, and Jess, I mean, we, we absolutely killed ourselves the past five years to get here. And all we, it was very intentional. We had a plan. It was a race to the finish line. We didn't want to grow, 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 grow like every brewery who's just constantly every year looking at the next property and the next brew house and the next set of tanks. We don't want that. We wanted to get to the finish line to a volume of beer that we thought could make us impactful in the American craft beer scene and now even abroad as we've we've started kind of growing that way and doing events and collaborations outside of the U.S. But the the growth that we're interested in and the growth that's been important to us over the last year is more horizontal growth. It's more um, accessing more consumers directly. It's finding better ways to maximize revenue, uh, improve margins, and cut uh, unnecessary costs. And I think that you'll see more and more brewers trying to do that. You know, how do I make every penny I can on every ounce of beer that I can make? And I think you you see us growing but i actually see us growing in a revenue standpoint even you know if we cap out at 10,000 barrels i i can promise you we'll continue to make more money over the next couple of years as we find better ways to improve that margin and to reach like i said reach consumers more directly which is something we're actively working on you know improving our our retail uh, environment but it's, it's, it's certainly, something I certainly think. Certainly there's a financial component. I mean, you're running a business. You want to make more money from the amount of revenue that you drive. And you do that by either cutting costs or, uh, you know, or actually primarily cutting costs or either raising revenue. But the other sideline benefit is that in the world of craft beer, I mean, you're making a consumable product. And that has a limited lifespan and needs to be taken really good care of. And those are other factors that I know, you know, you guys have face some challenges with you know the problem with with craft beer is that it has to be sold through this three-tier system and it has to go to some people that put it on a truck and move it to other people and you don't necessarily have control of how they take care of it how they treat it how they you know put it on the shelves any of those kinds of uh, factors but I, I would assume then that this kind of you know cap uh, allows you to maybe take more control about how your beer is sold how it's cared for how your consumers get it, how they have a relationship with you as a business, period. That's what I was going to say. That was where I was about to finish up on um, before was that business. I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, right no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it like that. Um, and I'll let Tim kind of talk about preserving quality. Uh, but, man, you know, not to be like, you know, we're not cocky about our story or anything like that. But we do feel like we put our heart and soul into this thing. And people that come to our tap room feel like they're in a different world and it is something that we are very proud of and something that we want to protect forever so meeting more consumers face to face is not only just about cutting out the middleman yes it is very intentionally and i'm not afraid to admit that it is also very much so that we can continue to share that environment with people that may not make it over to call your avenue i mean as as we send beer out into the world i mean you're you're absolutely right that that's one of the biggest stresses that we have as as brewers is you know we we baby these things along and we take as good care of it as we can but then it once it leaves our doors we, we don't really know what's happening to it and that's that is scary and i think we are have always been very intentional and actually have again put so much effort and time and, and face time in with 
the people that we work with, whether it's distributors or retailers, and we are we we will only work with distributors that are not only aware of our you know ethos as it pertains to where we want our beer, but they're you know they're down to work with on, us on that, and they under, they'll work within the guidelines that we give them. Um, so we are probably some of the more high maintenance <laughs> uh, breweries <laughs> that a lot of these people work with. But I mean, that's how how could you not be when when you're worried about quality and you know if you're what sorts of shelves your product is sitting on and how long it's sitting there and and all that stuff is is huge. I mean, I think that Doug kind of touched on this, but it's like we may. You know, well, we have entrepreneurial spirit, obviously, you know, and it's like we if we cap out our production at 10,000 barrels for the rest of time at, in Asheville, that doesn't necessarily mean that we couldn't, you know, dabble in business enterprises in other parts of the country that sure, are kind of sure. like tap rooms of some sort or, you know, retail outlets where we have we have control right. of it all. And that's again just ties back to what Doug's talking about where not only is there the obvious you know margin uh, control but it's being the face of the product you know controlling how people describe your beers and how they're yeah. written up on the board and all you know all those right. little details yeah I mean people are reviewing surf waxes nine months after it was it was canned. You know, I mean, just saying like that's sure. a reality for sure. us that's not a reality for a brewery who sells everything out the front door they're they're reviewing those beers nine days after they're released max, but you know I, I it's it's so funny like well I have to man our Twitter and Twitter <laughs> streams untapped check ins I don't check untapped but the untapped check ins show up in Twitter I see people checking into billows and we haven't canned billows since like July of last <laughs> year and you're like oh my god but that's the fear that you that you live with you know when you make the decision to distribute. You know, you do it very. You do it accepting the risks and the rewards. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful marketing rewards, relationship building rewards, cool trips to cool places. Um, but there's a lot of risks to your brand as well. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about how you guys make beer. You know, one of the things that I was struck by from the very earliest time that I had your beer was uh, a culinary approach. You know, you had things like tin cu- uh, tin cup camp stout and donut skillet stout and <laughs> I, uh, I came into the tap room once a couple of years ago and had a little donut hole garnishment on my stout. <laughs> Seemed rather fancy for uh, you know a brewery with scythes for door handles and uh, yeah, but but nonetheless, no judging on it. Um, there's there's been this culinary <laughs> approach at the same time that you've had this culinary approach to to some of these flavors and beers. Uh, you've also taken a, a fairly restrained approach to that, that uh, they're still fairly dry. They're not uh, overly sweet and, and sickly. I mean, there's there's this idea of capturing the flavor, but it's not. Um, it, it, what is it behind that that's, that's driven you to, to incorporate those flavors if you still have such a conservative approach towards them? I'm, I'm going to preface real quick because Tim will unload on, on this topic. <laughs> I let him. But... Uh, uh, Tim always says that you know people these days and the consumer trends that are that are driving the marketplace is people don't want to drink beer, you know they want to drink juice or pie, or something <laughs> other than beer, and that drives back. Every time he says that, I, I I get proud of us for a minute because I'm like, man, we always made beer. We were trying to make the most balanced, approachable package that people can enjoy start to finish that still exuded the spirit of whatever that adjunct characteristic might be and so that's always been something that's really really important to us but you know like funny funny enough like neither one of us are cooks and neither of us we even pretend to be cooks we're not even like good home cooks <laughs> but we we so love and respect um the bounty of incredible uh herbs fruits flowers vegetables that are out there and we see uh, such cool opportunities to create new styles for American brewers. I mean, we're supposed to be innovative in creating new styles. So we pay homage to the wonderful styles birthed in Belgium and Germany and England, but we're out here to create American styles. And so I'll leave that right there for Tim. To, uh, to go <laughs> I mean, that, I couldn't have ever summarized it better. That was, that was pretty perfect. I mean, it's so true. It's, we, you know, a good example is, you know, before we opened 
burial, we took a trip, the three owners, to Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, and France. And this was a research trip for us. And it was, um, we wanted to be just totally enwrapped in that culture, kind of in a lot of ways where beer started, you know, and, um, and those, you know, styles from Belgium and Germany, probably more than anywhere else, uh, are styles that really inspire us intensely. And, uh, you know, so yes, there is such a huge element of like an homage to, to those, the people that, you know, made those styles a thing. And, uh, and we, I think it would be sad to not show them some level of respect, you know, but at the same time, the, the beauty of American craft beer is that it is so innovative and it's, and it's kind of twisting and, and turning and, you know, making old styles into something new and, and exciting. So that, that is a huge part of what makes Burial Burial is that kind of a twist on a classic style and, you know, sometimes we, our, our inspiration come, I mean, inspiration for our beers comes from so many different places. Certainly the kitchen, but also, you know, cocktails is a huge thing. Mm. And, mm -hmm. you know, teas and juices. I mean, there's anything that people through the history of humanity have enjoyed in their mouth, you know, is open game for us to, <laughs> well, maybe not everyone, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, I mean, a great example is like right now we've been really excited about the idea of creating what we call Amaro ales. So, you know, Doug and I have really in the last couple of years got, got really interested in these Italian digestive liqueurs that are, you know, very herbal and bittersweet and, you know, sometimes spicy, sometimes floral. They're all just an absolute head trip to, to taste, you know, there's so much going on and, and these things have been being in production for hundreds or thousands of years. Sure. So they've been dialing in those flavors uh, and using these unique herbs and spices and flowers for forever. So, you know, how could we not be inspired by that idea and to try to somehow put it into a beer? Um, and that's just one small example of, of all the ways that you could be inspired to make fun, fun, exciting beers. But yeah, I mean, like Doug said, at the end of the day, it's, we're making beer, you know, right. like you cannot lose sight of that. It needs to have balance to some level. It needs to have graininess. It needs to have, you know, hoppiness. It, um, Malt hops and yeast. Yeah. You know? it's supposed to taste all that stuff. <laughs> So, I mean, I think that we, as much as we are sometimes like crotchety old men when we think about some of the new like trends in beer, you know, we're not, we're also not blind to that. And we, we want to, we want to have consumers, you know, be as excited about our beers as they are theirs, but to just try to, you know, bring who we are as people to the table in an equal part. And it can be a hard balance for sure. But, um, but I, th I feel like we've been pretty successful with it so far. In addition to that, you know, you all have made a conscious decision to, uh, you know, do things like your recent collab with other half where, uh, there was one for me and one for you. Uh, I imagine most people when they, you decided they, they heard you were going to do a collab with other half, especially down here in this market, got super excited for the hoppy beer that you're going to deliver to them. Uh, but you didn't. It had hops in it. <laughs> uh, yeah. You no, know, I mean, you grab any brewer. I don't really care who they are. I'm from whatever brewery they are from. Um, they're probably telling you that in their time off, they're, they're, drink, they're pulling for a lager. Everybody likes clean, refreshing beer. I mean, we all fell in love with those beers to begin with. I mean, that's what I stole from my daddy's fridge. I stole Bush. It was my favorite beer until I tried craft beer. And then I got into the you know, the whole vicious cycle of the craft beer circle where at some point you return back home. And I think for us, given the opportunity to brew with some of the best brewers in the country and Tim's amazing ambient terrain project, which you can talk about, um, is is a is a really cool 
indicator of how excited other brewers were are, are about the hopefully the 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 lager revolution that's hopefully upcoming but you know dealing you know working with um with the brewers that we're very close with i mean the first beer we all say that we want to make is a lager and then we get you have that like 20 seconds of how exciting that sounds and then your business mindset comes back in and you're like well shit <laughs> we, we have to sell us, this yeah we it takes us three times as long we could make three ipas in the time it's going to take us to make this one lager and we're going to sell this for half as much as we'd sell one of those ipas and so you you really have to be willing to kind of put a middle finger up to to that revenue uh, quandary and and uh and say this is what we want to make. This is what we believe in. This is what the hell we're gonna make. And uh, with, with other half with that project specifically, and we have another project coming up with Threes Brewing in Brooklyn called Anyway. And it's the the commentary is very much. It's very it's very explicit. You know, there's there's a commentary to that series. The one for me, one for you. You know, this is what I want. This is what you want. We can give you both. We're kind of reluctant to do it. That's why I only gave you a little bit of that batch. <laughs> Most of that batch was one for me. A little bit was one for you. Um, there's a lot of commentary there, and I'm 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 super proud uh, to to be a brewer who's willing to speak that commentary because it's not always great um, to to be out outspoken about uh, consumer trends. But um, it, it, at the end of the day, if you don't make what you want to make, you will be miserable in this business, and you will never be proud of yourself. And uh, you may l- make a little bit less money, but you're going to get to put, kick your feet up on the deck one day and enjoy a nice lager beer and, with a smile on your face. And that's all we're looking for. So for much of the history of craft, craft beer, I mean, it's been positioned in this oppositional you know, stance against big beer. And one of the big like cruxes of that oppositional stance was this lager you know, versus ale thing that, uh, you know, uh, that's most craft brewers didn't make lagers because, I mean, hell, you can just go get a you know lager from uh, from any of the big American macro brewers. But why is that? Well, I mean, why do craft brewers feel so attracted to it now, other than this sense of historic nostalgia for the beer that I first stole out of my dad's fridge? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's more. There has to be more to it than that. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely talk on that. Um, at risk of getting, uh, you know. A little bit revolutionary, or if you will, or you know, I mean, I, I honestly feel like if you look back on the history of American macro lager production as it evolved, is in a lot of ways it was all about making a very ubiquitous product to make as cheap as you possibly can and to get out there so that it's as cheap as it can be in the 7 Eleven and they all taste the same and they're not very flavorful because of that you know they're using filler grains and you're using you know hop extracts and so many elements of the way those beers are produced is to just make it as cheap as possible and obviously anything you do in that sense is going to lack character you know what i mean so i think that we all have a a sense of nostalgia and, you know, to some degree a respect for those beers because almost all of us started drinking beer with macro lagers, right? But I think we also realize that we can make those styles exponentially more flavorful using the craft beer mentality and using really great ingredients and using really, you know, kind of forward thinking processes and um, and we can, you know, we can pay homage to German techniques. Um, and like Doug just said, we're, we're taking a hit financially in a lot of ways by making these beers. But it's out of a passion. It's out of a love for the style. It's out of a desire to have something that's really drinkable and crisp and clean. And, you know, that we can drink a bunch of and it's not going to make us sleepy and... You know, I mean, there's so mm-hmm. many things about the beauty of these styles that we can, we have the capability to, to like really accentuate that. And, and with this ambient terrain lager series, I mean, that's really what, what it's about. It, you know, it's about these people that are in our community that are really passionate about these beers and making them because 
not you know not because it's a big money maker because it's a big trend there that you know it's because of the love of beer of the style so you know we've been making beers with our our friends from all around the country and and every beer in the series is a three-way collaboration between another brewery and a craft maltster in the area area of that brewery um, and we're trying to you know the beers are a hundred percent uh, of their hundred percent of the malt or the grain is coming from this one craft maltster and you know I could I could go on and on about the same things about these people that are are craft maltsters you know they're that is not an easy business model especially when you're doing things on a small scale I mean that that whole concept is a labor of love and a lot of end consumers are so blind to what these people are doing for our scene and we're trying to bring them to light as well and you know make these lagers that actually taste like these unique terroir driven grains that's a good point i I mean those beers if you're going to capture if you're going to capture the subtleties of that malt they have to be delicate beers they have to be light beers they have to be very clean beers and lagers fit the bill for that um, you know, if it was an adjuncted stout, I mean, any any malt mm-hmm. character is going to get completely lost yeah. and abandoned. If it's a yeah. hoppy beer, the hops are going to just mask any or most of that that malt character to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but in in today's craft beer consumer world, are are there enough folks out there that uh, that kind of get what you do, and and can feel are willing to embrace that approach to nuance in order. In order to taste those flavors, I mean, that's yet to be. Are you just going to create these consumers? It's yet to be determined. I think we are, in a way, trying to create the consumers by telling the stories of the people and of the process Mm -hmm. and of the ingredients and the value of all that. I mean, I'd like to think that, you know, us as brewers, we've gone through this life cycle that Doug touched on, where we start drinking, you know, cheap beer and then we discover craft. And we go through this process where, you know, Belgian beers and and big stouts and big IPAs are just so flavorful, like, you know, and you just you're so drawn to the give me as much flavor as you want. And then you you kind of peek out on that and you get a little bit, you know, fatigued by that. And then you 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 also are educated through that process and you start to learn uh, what it takes to produce a lager and, you know, the 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 delicacy of that and how how any little mishap along the process can can be very detrimental to the finished beer and you know so then you start respecting it alone more and then you see your palate seems to just kind of crave oh i i'm drinking these big beers all day you know i just give me something light and crisp and easy you know and i'd like to think that the general craft beer drinking public is is it's growing it's grown so much recently that it's still in those kind of early stages of of experience and that if that evolution for them is anything like ours then they'll they will hopefully be enlightened to the to the beauty of these i mean what better way to to grow that and to to get consumers interested and get you know 10 of the best brewers in the world in in a in into that program. I mean that was definitely very intentional of Tim. It was like, you know, if we're gonna get people's attention and and start getting them getting them to really truly respect, you know, malt and lager beer again, you know, we're gonna have to build an audience and, and what better way than to bring some of those best brewers into the into the fold to do so. That makes a lot of sense. We have a, a trend and that trend might be adjuncts and big things, but for every trend, there's a counter trend. Mm-hmm. And these things tend to keep each other in balance, uh, you know, to some amount. And yeah, we uh, definitely all we, we've definitely talked about it so many times. We're like, when will they all burn out? <laughs> <laughs> when will the hops be too much to bear? And uh, yeah, I don't know if it'll ever happen. Who knows? But it is uh, it, there, right? There's a balance to the world. So you hope maybe at some point you tip over, and people just want. Uh, clean, crisp, clear, wonderful, refreshing beer. And you all do mixed fermentation and sour beer as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you're not afraid to dabble in those styles. But it, you know, again, from what I've sampled from you all in that realm, 
Um, they tend to be restrained acidity, pretty low acidity, or uh, yes, low low amounts of acid in the beers, more tart than full on, you know, over the top sour. They tend to to have more restrained flavors in them. They use hopping in in gentle and uh, in subtle ways to accomplish specific flavor goals. Um, you know, and that philosophy even pervades that kind of fermentation program. Yeah, I, uh, man, I. We get so much crap for the for how quaffable our, our wild beers are. I'm like, you Jesus, get crap for that. Wait a minute. People complain <laughs> I mean, about it. It was that. easy to drink and enjoyable and lightly refreshing. Not enough acid or weird fun. It's it's uh yeah. I mean we if I, every once in a while I'll share one of those reviews with Mark, our head blender, who like if you give Mark a beer that has a shred, I mean the tiniest morsel of acetic acid in it, he will he will dump it out right away. Just, I can't do it. I mean, he, he this is you know we hired Mark because he had very much the same mentality that Tim and I had, which was to keep keep those beers purely about um, the cultures of the microbes that are within them. Um, we want to taste everything in them. We don't want them to be overwhelming. We don't want them to just be fruit juice, and we don't want them to just be acid. We want them to be a quaffable beer, and uh, Mark's done such an amazing job, I think, so far, really, kind of creating a, a, a creating an outward vision for burial. And despite everybody's disdain for the <laughs> our lack of acidity or whatever, it's not going to change because we're very, very proud of those beers. You know, I think that's an interesting thing that I've I've heard it from brewers, you know, all over the country, um, you know, from California to the the Northeast, that the beers that certain consumers seem to want from them are much more intense on the sour side than the mm-hmm. ones they actually want to make and they'd love to make them in a more balanced way but just people have that expectation it's almost like titratable acidity is a, is a new ibu where <laughs> uh, you know there's some sort of war to like prove uh which and then ibu was the old uh abv before mm-hmm. that where craft brewer, craft beer drinkers like oh I can drink a ten percent beer. I'm I'm so cool and so so awesome about that. <laughs> and then it was like, I can drink a thousand IBU beer. Um, aren't I tough for being able to do that? And now it's like I can drink a twenty five TA sour beer, and uh, you know my head wants to blow up. But <laughs> I, uh, you know, aren't I so you know so tough and so much smarter? Just drink my lord you know? if you want to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> Sam probably has a lot of input on that, but I just yeah, I mean, I just think really. Owning a business is hard, and you know, being as creative as we want to be is hard. And you know, we we just if we don't make beers that we love and that we want to drink, then that's it's not going to keep us going and keep us moving in the direction we want, and it's not going to bring us happiness. And I mean, I think that we're, we're very conscious of what the public wants, and you know periodically we might <laughs> might give them that you know <laughs> but but it, that doesn't drive our business exactly i mean it, yeah it, t- to some degree but i mean we're really just trying to make beers that we're really passionate about and that we stand behind and it doesn't really we'd love to see a, a 4.75 on you know untapped but if there's a beer that we love and want to drink every day that's a 3.75 then we're kind of like it doesn't really matter to us that much so um, I think it just it's something that has always tied our entire company together is this idea of just being like let's be ourselves uh, to a fault and it's not going to be for everybody but the people that that it is for I think are going to feel that passion you know, and that's all we can ask for. Who would have thought that the oppositional stance in craft beer today would be making lagers? <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's <laughs> yes, it's yeah. its own thing. It well, is kind it's of so <laughs> easy to be the enemy these days. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. also kind of just one of those things that people always say that like yeah. trends are cyclical, you know sure, what I mean? Sure. And like, we certainly did not come up with this idea to, to make loggers, but. I want to thank you guys, Tim and Doug, for joining me on the podcast. If people thank want to learn more about Burial Beer, uh, where do they find you guys? 
Oh, uh, <laughs> come to the source, 40 <laughs> Collier Avenue in Asheville. Uh, that's our downtown tap room, our original, our original brewery where the Nano Brew uh, first was born, and it's our 10 barrel pub and mix mixed culture cellar now, um, where we birth all of our mixed culture beer. Um, and then if you come visit us this summer in June or so, you'll be able to visit uh, the forestry camp, which is our uh, production facility barrel houses and uh, beer bar uh and i don't have a date on that officially because god knows <laughs> what construction we've will allow this for enough yeah we've know. been through it enough to not give a date uh, but it, it should be open this summer we're extremely excited about it it's it's been a dream project for tim jess and i for a number of years now so it's it's almost here yeah. Well, we're recording at the forestry camp right now, and you can hear the uh, forklift and the uh, other machinery from the production brewery in the background. Uh, but the, the location for the new tap room here uh, looks absolutely gorgeous, even Thank in you. its completely raw state. Yeah. Um, it you feels... just open it like that. As long as they kind of want it like that. <laughs> I don't think it would be much nicer than that. So. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Well, thanks, Tim and Doug. Uh, thanks for listening and tuning in to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. Uh, if you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you enjoyed what we talk about, subscribe to the Craft Beer and Brewing magazine at beerandbrewing.com. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by the sour beer drinking folks at Fooder Crafters. They make fooders specifically for breweries and love every brewer they have ever met. Fooder Crafters would like to say thank you to all the good people in this industry. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.